Well, welcome everyone. Welcome. Um, I just want to thank you for coming. I'm Lori Marino and I'm going to be introducing our special guests. I just wanted to very, very briefly say just a couple of things um, about uh, why I'm sitting at this table. And uh, I'm actually a faculty member here at Emory. I'm a neuroscientist and also an advocate for other animals. I'm also the executive director of the Camilla Center for Animal Advocacy, which is a new nonprofit organization bringing science and animal advocacy together. So for the past 20 years or so, I've studied brains, intelligence, and self-awareness in dolphins and whales. And I've studied the brains of many different species, including orcas, and this is all from individuals who died naturally. Um, I've also studied cognition and intelligence in dolphins and whales. Uh, in 2001, in 2001 I, I published a paper with Diana Reese demonstrating that bottlenose dolphins recognize themselves in mirrors. And this study showed that dolphins and humans have a very similar sense of self. It's not identical, but there's some overlap there. But soon after that study, I realized that uh, the, the captivity was not a good place for these animals. They're intelligent, they're self-aware, and in fact, the animals that I worked with on that study died soon after that. So I stopped conducting research on captive dolphins and whales. The dolphins in the mirror study were bottlenose, but they were dolphins and so are orcas. Um, and because they are dolphins, they share a level of intelligence, psych uh, their psychology and social complexity that makes it impossible for them to thrive in captivity. Orcas have brains over two and a half times the size you would expect for their body size. Now, I have not been the only scientist that has sat back in awe by the sheer grandeur of the neuroanatomy of the orca brain. It is impressive. It is a brain that dwarfs our own, and it is a brain that in many ways is more elaborated than our own. These brains are not only oversized, but they exhibit features that make it absolutely clear that these are highly cognitively and emotionally complex beings. And again, this complexity makes it impossible for their needs to be met in captivity. The stresses of captivity on these large complex beings are evidenced in their poor health, their shorter lives, and abnormal behavior in captivity. And this leads us to the topic at hand, this wonderful, wonderful substantive book, Death at Sea World, by David Kirby and the tragedy of captivity for both humans and orcas. I think that David's book tells us that captivity does not work for orcas and it does not work for people and it never will. So I am very pleased to have with us tonight David Kirby, the author of Death at Sea World, and Dr. Naomi Rose, who is with Humane Society International, and for two decades has been a wonderful scientist advocate for our dolphins and whales. I'm going to now uh, turn the floor over to David, and then Naomi will speak. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moreno. Uh, thank you, everyone, and I just want to point out that there's quite a number of cameras here, and uh, we're live streaming this as well, and I think people are going to be twittering in questions and everything, and 
for the benefit of the people not here, we have a packed house. And I'm just thrilled to see so many people here. Thank you. Uh, it's really great. I, I'm glad to see interest in this subject. I'm glad to see interest in people like Naomi and uh, Dr. Marino, or Lori, I guess I should say. Mm -hmm. These are not only people I consider friends, and they're not only amazing scientists, they're characters in the book, Death at Sea World. Uh, Naomi is, is, is the lead character, really. It tells her story, and through her eyes, we really get to learn about killer whales in the wild. And then later on in the book, through the eyes of trainers and former trainers, we get to contrast with the lives of killer whales in captivity. And I thought it was so important to deeply describe the science behind their intelligence, behind their social behavior. And <clears throat> these two women were just instrumental. Um, I was telling Lori, I got to interview her on San Juan Island as the orcas were basically splashing offshore. And we just sat there with a the tape recorder on a beautiful summer day. And she told me all about the brain anatomy of killer whales. And I was just so captivated. And then to go out and see them and, and see, kind of put it all together, it was amazing. So I'm, I'm so uh, happy to be here. Um, there are other characters from my book, at least one that I just wanted to mention. Uh, he's hugely central to the whole book, and he doesn't even appear until the epilogue. So I'm trying to figure out how I pulled that one off. But he is the main attorney for OSHA. Uh, you may know, if you haven't read the book, SeaWorld sued the federal government after the federal government hit them with the, the highest level violation in the death of the trainer Don Branchow in, in Orlando. And SeaWorld decided to sue the government to overturn the violation. And the end of the book ends with that trial. And, and I've, I consider myself a, an amateur legal scholar, and, and I know a little bit about the law. And John was really good. <laughs> 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 and, and he won, uh, for the most part. Um, the violation was, was reduced from willful to serious. But the most important thing is all of the abatements that the judge ordered are still in place. Um, this legal fight continues, but I'm just really happy that John came. And just as a coincidence, John lives in Atlanta, and my, I also have, I have my lead character from my latest book, I also have my lead character from my first book here, and that's Lynn Redwood. My first book was about autism and the possible role of thimerosal, the mercury-containing preservative, uh, which is a known neurotoxin injected into newborn babies that might produce neurological symptoms that we call autism. Uh, when I first came to Atlanta, I met Lynn, it was whew, 10 years ago, I think. <clears throat> she picked me up at the airport, her son could barely speak, and she just dropped him off at college. So I like to think that the people I profile know what they're doing. And, and she turned her son's autism around. So if anybody says autism is incurable, go, go have a, a word, not only with Lynn, but with her fabulous husband, Tommy, uh, who's a surgeon here in Atlanta and work just as hard as Lynn did on, on their son. So this is an interesting reunion <laughs> of sorts. Um, I wrote this book because, um, because of Larry King, actually. <laughs> uh, my second book, which I feel like I should have somebody here for my second book, uh, was about factory farming. And you may remember two summers ago when there was that giant egg recall, uh, about 500 million eggs were contaminated with salmonella, I was writing about that subject, so I got invited to go speak on, on Larry King that night. And we were in the second segment. The first segment was the OSHA violation. Uh, OSHA had just slapped SeaWorld with this you know, violation in Don Branchow's death. And I remember that day. That had happened in February of 2010. I'm a writer. I work at home. I sometimes keep CNN or MSNBC on in the background or whatever. And I remember very clearly that split screen day with that whale up in the corner by himself. And I remember feeling terrible for the trainer and her family and friends. And I remember feeling nothing for the whale. It just didn't even occur to me, even then, the captivity might have something to do with the fact that this woman was dead. I just, I, I would, that's how basically ignorant I was. So I went on Larry King and I'm watching and this woman, Linda Simons, who was a former high level executive at SeaWorld had stepped forward to basically accuse the company of all kinds of malfeasance and stonewalling and basically obstruction of justice in the investigation of Don Branchow. And you know, my jaw was kind of, I had to scrape it off the floor of the green room <laughs> watching this. It was, the, the, the allegations were so serious and what she was saying was so shocking. And SeaWorld to me was such a squeaky, shiny, happy 
family place that it just seemed incongruous. I didn't expect this. And then, of course, there was this bloody shouting match between Rick O'Berry and Thad Lassen, a former SeaWorld executive. And that's when I knew this was not only an interesting subject, it was a very emotional one. So I called my agent the next day. I said, this is a great story. But I'm an investigative journalist. I, I, I mostly have written about corporate malfeasance. And that's where I was going with this. You know, this, this image of SeaWorld being contradicted by what this whistleblower was coming forward to say with these shocking allegations. Well, I quickly learned that whether trainers should be in the water with killer whales or not is not really the question at hand. I mean, it's huge for the federal government. But for me, the real question became, should killer whales be in this environment in the first place? So my subject matter, it didn't change, it grew. From the death of Don Branchow, the investigation, the allegations of cover-up, to the dangers of whales in captivity, to what are whales doing in captivity in the first place? Because as I said, I gave it no thought. Um, I grew up in Southern California. I went to, uh, to SeaWorld as a kid. I saw the original Shamu, which if you're good at math, you can figure out I'm not young. Um, <laughs> this is quite a while ago. Um, so again, I, I was neutral. I was completely agnostic about captivity. <clears throat> um, I, I knew a little bit about swim with dolphin programs that they probably weren't really great for the animals. So I very quickly, I, I write my books as narrative nonfiction, so to tell a good story, you need good characters to tell it for you. So it reads like a novel, and almost instantly, if you Google killer whales, the name Naomi Rose will come up <laughs> definitely on the first page. Uh, she's one of the leading experts in the world, and she happens to work for the Humane Society and dedicate her life and her work to not only killer whales in captivity, but all kinds of marine mammals in captivity. And I found out she had been in British Columbia for five summers studying killer whales in the wild. So I immediately <coughs> knew who my through character was going to be. Um, and then I sort of got contacted by these trainers who used to work at SeaWorld Orlando. And they were just starting to come out and speak out against the practice and, and, and against the dangers in the way that trainers uh, are trained and the safety that they receive and the way the animals are treated. So I started seeing a, a book coming together and it was really a wonderful experience. So again, I wanted to, I wanted to learn about killer whales in the wild and I wanted readers to, I, I also write a lot about science and, and I, I wanted to make the reader work a little bit. Um, you have to learn because if you don't learn, you can't appreciate if you don't realize how magnificent life in the wild is for these animals, you cannot really appreciate how awful it, it really must be for them in a tank. So I went to San Juan Island a couple of times. I went with Naomi up to Johnstone Strait in northern Vancouver Island, where she did five years of field research. And I read her dissertation, which was outstanding. And I spent time with people like Ken Balcom, who studies whales, and Paul Spong, if you know the... the, 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 the community up there. Uh, these are some of the top researchers in their field. And what I learned was just so, so wonderful, and what I saw was so wonderful. And I learned about their family bonds, and, and I'm sure uh, Naomi will be talking about this, and I learned about their intelligence. And I learned that the males stay with their mothers for life. Uh, they're one of the few mammals in the world who do that, and how does that work? And Naomi's original research produced the answer. And I'll let her describe it, but it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And I saw how these whales, and I learned how they, they care for each other. And I learned that they recognize themselves in mirrors because they're dolphins. And I learned that they live a really long time. I saw a 100-year-old female that they call Granny uh, in the southern resident community jumping out of the water, estimated to be 100 years old. I saw females that were 60, 70 years old. I saw males that were 40, 50 years old with their perfectly erect dorsal fins. Um, I saw them rolling around in the kelp and spy hopping and breaching and calling out to each other. And in San Juan Island, the beauty of it is you can just pull over on the side of the road or go to the state park for free. Um, one of them now charges $10 for parking, but there's a dose <laughs> in there, a, a naturalist who will sit there and the whales come by every day in the summer on the west side of San Juan and children and parents are there watching this and learning and it's just it's an amazing experience and one day I was out with Michael Mountain and a few other people we were in a place called Eagle Point and 
the entire J pod, um, there's, there, up in that part of the Pacific, you have what are called resident whales. These are the ones that stay together for life in large pods. They're mostly fish eating, um, and they're extremely social. Then you have the transient whales, which travel together in much smaller pods. They're the ones who eat mammals. They're the ones who kick the seals up in the air um, and uh, are very aggressive. You have a third type called offshores, which are very rarely seen. They spend most of their time out in the ocean. But the residents are the ones that are most studied, most known, most identified. And uh, they're the ones that have the closest relationship with people. Ken Balcom told me that every summer in the, or spring, when the whales come back, there's always a few newborns. And the mothers go right to his boat. They know the sound of his engine. They bring their babies to his boat because they know he's interested. And I think they're probably saying, hey, this guy's OK. This boat's OK. These people are going to hurt you. He claims they even turn the whales upside down, and he's able to sex them. Now, whether they do that specifically, I don't know. But it tells you there's somebody there. There's somebody home. And I experienced it out on Eagle Point one day where this J-Pod, there must have been 30 whales in this bay. And the other great thing about watching from a cliff is the boats have to stay 200 yards away. I know. So when the whales come in close to shore, you get a great show. <laughs> and we were watching them and watching them, and all of a sudden these three whales came swimming right in front of us. And we could see the salmon scattering out of the way. And then they dove. And we sat and we waited. Well, they're going to come up. You know, they'll probably come up you know, 50 yards down like they do. They never came back up. And then we, lo we looked out over the bay, gone. Everybody, gone. So Granny probably gave some kind of call that we'll never decipher. Every single whale in that pod said, we're leaving, we're leaving now, we're going that way. And they were gone. And that just blew me away, to be honest. To have that kind of uh, coordination and communication and cohesion and, and you've probably seen the whales hunting in, in the Antarctic, where they, they make a, a line up and they'll rush an ice flow with a seal on it. And they'll create a wave and the seal will slide into the water. There's usually another whale there to catch it. They often let that seal get back up and they do it again and again because they want to wear out the prey. And they're actually kind of tenderizing the meat a little bit. But this is what they do. And the amount of coordination that takes, you can imagine. You know, so you have these lifelong bonds, you have this uncanny intelligence, you have this amazing communication, and you have this longevity. And I was so fascinated. And then I went to Sea World. And then I really started looking into what life is like for these animals at Sea World. And these former trainers paint a completely different picture. And the science paints a completely different picture. When we look at longevity, Instead of living 50, 60, 70 years, these animals are living 4, 5, 10, maybe 20 years. Tillicum is pushing 30. He's an outlier. Um, most animal, most killer whales in captivity die, I would say, in their teens or 20s. And if you look at the science, if you look at annual survival rate and annual mortality rate, so at the end of the year, what percentage of that herd or that pod is still alive, up in the Pacific Northwest, in the resident pods, the mortality, or excuse me, the mortality rate at SeaWorld, or in captivity, is two and a half times the annual mortality rate in the wild. And for me, that alone, that was it. That was like, okay, you know what? I'm a journalist. I always tell, or try to tell both sides of a story. I'm, I'm writing a book, so I get to have a point of view. But my point of view is the captivity is wrong. And, and I, I cannot come to any other conclusion now knowing what I know. For me to go out and say, well, I'm a journalist, and so I don't have an opinion, and I can't really say, and yes, it's good because education happens, so I think on balance it's fine. I, I would be lying, and I'm not going to do that. And, and that's just the longevity issue, which I do think is the most important. But, but I think you know, their, their deaths can be quite brutal, as well as young, and I describe them. And the way that they die, not only the rate at which these animals die, the way that they die. Uh, one died when a gate crashed his skull. Um, one died in a fight with another female when she, she broke a, a, a blood vessel in her rostrum and bled to death in front of a crowd, spurting blood up through her blowhole. Two whales have died from mosquito-borne tropical diseases because they rest so much, they spend so much time resting at the surface in hot, muggy weather, Texas and Orlando. 
uh, they get one died of West Nile and one died of St. Louis encephalitis. They don't get these in Alaska, in British Columbia, in Iceland. Whales don't die of tropical mosquito-borne diseases. Some have died in childbirth. Um, some have died just from, from horrible other tumors and, 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 and digestive issues and things like that. Um, and the fact that more don't die is kind of a miracle. Um, SeaWorld works really, really hard just to keep these animals alive. And I think that's what I, I wrote a chapter called Breakfast at SeaWorld where the trainers described how they would stuff the gills of the fish with antibiotics and antacids and uh, um, uh, vitamins and how frozen fish, when you freeze fish and thaw it out, it not only loses nutrition, it loses fresh water. And for cetaceans, whales and dolphins, who are mammals and need fresh water, their only source is fish or their prey. And so these animals become dehydrated. And you may, in the very, very famous video of Don Branchell right before she died, she's throwing giant chunks of gelatin into Tillicum's mouth. He gets 80 pounds a day just to try to uh, replace some of the fresh water he's, he's losing out on. Um, Tillicum was on injections. He was on a whole range of drugs the day that he killed Don Brancho. He wasn't feeling good. So these animals do get sick. It's, it's, it's a huge task to try to keep them alive. I've heard talk that they get antidepressants. I don't know if I've ever been able to confirm that. Um, and then there are issues <laughs> like uh, the dental work that they have to have done because they break their teeth on the metal gates. And once the teeth gets broken, SeaWorld, they have trained the animals to put up with this. They take a handheld held drill that you buy at Home Depot, and they drill the pulp out until, until the blood spurts out, and then they know they've, they've reached the, the nerve, and they hollow out the tooth. And then for the rest of that animal's life, they have to wash out its hollow teeth, the ones that have been hollowed out, three times a day to prevent bacteria from getting in there and from the animal dying of sepsis. Then, of course, there's the dorsal fin collapse. All the males at SeaWorld, all the adults, have completely flopped over dorsal fins, which is very rare in the wild. And the only known cases that I'm familiar with were, were whales that were in distress. Uh, two whales that were in the, the Valdez, Exxon Valdez spill, who later died. And I think another whale that had been hit by a boat. So it, to me, that's a sign of ill health. Um, it's also a sign of spending too much at the surface. That fin is made of cartilage. It's six feet tall. It's huge. No cartilage. Not cartilage. Mm -hmm. Disconnective tissue. Disconnective tissue. <laughs> it's Don't like cartilage. That. <laughs> no, no, no. I want to be accurate. Forgive me. Uh, and, 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 and it flops over. So if you are this really smart animal and you live this remarkable life that has evolved after five million years, and you have this giant brain, and you're in love with your family, and you spend your whole life by your mother's side, and you're suddenly snatched out of the water, and taken away, and shipped off. And then I tell the story of Tillicum, and I told it from his point of view, and I, I've taken a little heat from that here and there, but I don't mind. I think it was really important to tell that chapter from his point of view. And then he gets shipped off to sea land of the Pacific, and then one day a trainer slips, and her foot goes in the water. He's never seen that before. He's been put in a, in a tank with two older females. Of course, females dominate orca society, and they beat the crap out of him all the time. And he sees this trainer's foot, and he grabs it, and he pulls her in, and he doesn't want to let go. And it takes two hours to get her body out of the water. Now, Sealand doesn't want him, doesn't want the other two whales. Who's going to take them? SeaWorld decides they are. So, so Tillicum and one of the females come to Orlando, a few years later, uh, a, a transient stays, a, a trespasser, climbs over the fence, stays late, goes into Shamu Stadium, decides to strip down to his shorts and go for a swim. Of all the pools he could have chosen, he chose Tillicum's pool. Um, Tillicum messed with him before he died. There were pre-mortem injuries and post-mortem injuries, including, and I don't usually talk about this, but it's actually kind of interesting and grotesque, but I think it's important. Tillicum ripped his shorts open opened his scrotum and left one of his testicles on the bottom of the pool floor. Now, if that's not a message, I don't know what is. But it seems to me that Telecom was trying to tell somebody something. Um, and yet, he was still at SeaWorld, and then, of course, Don Branchow died, a, a far more brutal death. 
than, than either of the first two people had. And it was only later that we found out that a fourth person had died just two months before Don died at Laurel Parque in Spain. And it was a SeaWorld whale that killed him. And it was a SeaWorld trainer who was running the practice session. And it was SeaWorld safety protocol in use. And yet, right after that trainer died in Spain, there was a news blackout, nobody knew about it. SeaWorld went right back to water work. And so people were in the whales with the water, or in the water with the whales. And, and nobody ever got in the water with Tilikum, but the senior trainers were allowed to get on a shallow shelf, a ledge. And that's where Don Bradshaw was on February 10th after this little Dying with Shamu lunchtime show. She was having what's called a relationship session with him. She was inches away from him in about 10 inches of water, and he grabbed her. And he pulled her in, and he rammed her, and he dismembered her, and he killed her. Um, and it was awful. And now, when I think about that, I still feel horrible for Dawn and her family. How could you not? But I kind of, I'm not saying I understand why Tillicom did this, but I am saying the stress of captivity on these animals must do something to their mental health and to their state of being. And, 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 and so just add it up, the, the longevity issues, the mental health issues, the separation from family, the aggression, <laughs> the, the poor health, the, the short longevity, which I guess I mentioned, and then the danger to people around these whales. Well, when the judge made his ruling, he told SeaWorld, not only stay away from Tillicum at all costs, but you need to stay away from the other whales. So not just don't do water work with them, where they get in the water and they leap from them and everything. You can't even be in close proximity. You need a distance and you need a physical barrier. Well, SeaWorld to this day, right now, the trainers are hugging and kissing. When the whales come up on the slide out there, there's no barrier, there's no distance. They're basically saying, you know what, to the judge. And there will be some kind of reckoning here. I mean, this is going to come to a head and the government will eventually <laughs> uh, intervene. SeaWorld, meanwhile, is uh, filing an appeal in the Federal Court of Appeals to try to overturn this, this judge's ruling. Um, I, they've lost every battle they've, they've tried on this issue. So finally, just what has happened is a tragedy. Four people have been killed. Many more have been injured um, in the name of entertainment. No, none of them were killed researching whales. They were not killed gathering science, they were not killed in the name of knowledge or education or advancing humanity's relationship with marine creatures. They were killed in shows, except for the transit. Um, and we have to remember that. I mean, this is entertainment. The company is called SeaWorld Parks and Entertainment. I think Lori and Naomi can speak to the lack <coughs> or the poor quality of education and research that comes out mm -hmm. of SeaWorld, particularly when it comes to SeaWorld, the uh, killer whales their biggest draw. So I think, I hope I've explained why, even as a journalist, I'm comfortable sitting here saying I am personally opposed to captivity for killer whale after researching it, speaking with the experts, speaking with people who used to work there, speaking with government officials, weighing the evidence. I just can't come to any other conclusion. It's inappropriate. And it's probably immoral. And it's probably time to start to phase it out. Nobody's saying close the doors tomorrow. You know, a lot of people's jobs depend on these whales. But I think it served its purpose. And I think society is front. You can't know what I know about killer whales and think it's okay. Is I guess the bottom line. So thank you. <laughs>